was all right. No, do it. There was no sound. Okay. Hi. So uh, we've been working on a uh, pension reform modeling project. This is our team. Uh, you've probably seen all of us around. Uh, Dennis Warty, David Melton, and Tim Sharko. And there are many others that have come and gone. Some have stuck, which is great. Um, Nathan Pilger is also on our team, and he can't come tonight. He has a couple of other commitments. So um, let's see. So this presentation we've been giving both to uh, people who know a lot about pensions but don't know anything about civic hacking, and now we're going to give it to people who know about civic hacking but maybe not about pensions. So there's some uh, useless slides in here. We'll go through them as quickly as possible, uh, the ones that don't apply for you. So this is what we're doing. And in case you don't know, we come from Open Government Hack Night, a bunch of do-gooders. And then as a uh, nod to Chris Whitaker, I have a Pension 101 slide. Uh, not everyone knows that much about pensions, especially if uh, you're younger and don't, aren't thinking about it. So pensions work in two different ways. Basically, a pension is a financial investment that's designed to support your standard of living in that short period between the time you retire and the time you die. They come in two forms. One uh, is probably mostly familiar with people who work in the private sector now, is defined contribution. And the idea is that you put a fixed amount of money into these investments, your employer matches a fixed amount through the magic of the capital markets when you retire, it's bigger and hopefully will support you in your, uh, in your twilight years. The other kind is defined benefit where the employer guarantees how much money you're going to get for the rest of your life once you retire. Um, the interesting distinction is that with the defined contribution, the employer is responsible for what happens in the stock markets. So if you were unfortunate enough to retire in 2008, it was not a very pleasant conversation. And then part of what we've been thinking about is that it, is it fair to make secretaries, janitors, uh, people that don't understand the capital markets have their entire lives determined by the stock market. If you're a capitalist and work in that market, then that's great. That makes a lot of sense. But I think there's some ethical issues around uh, defined benefit. Funded ratio. It's a scary word. It means uh, from actuary, you can determine, on average, how much you expect the pension plan to have to pay out. So that's all the benefits, how much it's going to increase, uh, how long you expect the uh, employee to live versus how much money you have backing it up. So if you were prudent, you would have 100% of the money in your account to pay for the pensions of all your employees. If you want to take a little bit of a risk, you might go down to 95%. So have 95% of the money in your account to pay for your pensioners. Or if you're feeling really lucky, you could be like Illinois and have 40 45 percent. <laughs> now, another important word in this is compounding. Uh, there are two ways that investments uh, can work. One is, is called simple interest. So if you borrow $1,000, I promise to pay you 10% interest every year. That means in the first year, I'll pay you $100. Uh, the next year, I'll pay you $100, so on and so forth. So it doesn't, for the entire life of the investment, it's always the same amount of money. And so a kind of a graph of that is just a straight line, it looks like that. Compounding uh, has where each year I pay you 10% of how much money you've got. And I, so the first year I gave you $100, so now the next year is 10% of $1,100. And so over time, that looks like this. It has a, a, a nice steep curve to it. This is an important topic, and it will occur many times in our story tonight. Uh, the final co concept I'd like to introduce is cost of living adjustment. If you are in a defined contribution plan, that's your problem. How much inflation have occurs uh, during the time of your retirement, that's just your problem, and hopefully the, your investments will keep up. With a defined benefit, it's very important that if inflation takes off during your retirement, that your payments, which may have been comfortable when you first retired, might not afford you uh, your standard of living after a few years of inflation. And so a cost of living adjustment is a key fact or a key factor in defined benefit plans. And we'll be seeing some more of those later. So here's the scary chart. This is showing the unfunded liability 
starting from 1970 at a mere snip at $1.46 billion. Uh, over to here today, well, actually, only that was two years ago, $97 billion. Um, I'll stand for a second. The sad part is this is the wildly optimistic version of this chart. Uh, this is assuming that the state can get 7.5% uh, on its investments, which anyone who's tried to uh, um, invest a portfolio or uh, do their own investment knows that's very hard to get these days. So it's very interesting. I, <coughs> I'm not exactly sure what happened in here. I think that it's- That was reform, that was a reform. That was a reform. So that was a, a nice attempt at that reform. Was to fix the problem, yeah. Uh, and so the reason why you're, this, this shape that you're seeing here is that thing I mentioned earlier, compounding, that if you fall behind, you fall behinder and behinder very quickly. Especially when you're not making the payments along the way. Yes. So the magnitude of the problem, $111 billion in unfunded liabilities of all just the state uh, pension funds. There are five main pension funds that the state's responsible for. The city of Chicago has its own, all the municipalities have their own, all with their own various problems. But let's stick with the state for now. Uh, according to Wolfram Alpha, that winds up being $23,000 for every family in Illinois, or $146,000 for every employee that's in the system. Uh, and then because of uh, how uh, liberal the uh, returns that they're putting into this model, it's probably closer to $150 billion. The takeaway point here, though, from this our presentation is this problem is solvable. Uh, you have to make some tough decisions, and you have to take everyone into consideration, but as long as we act now, it's solvable. All right. So that's fine, but let's point some fingers. How did we get here? <laughs> uh, so very little of it was uh, just salary increases beyond what the, the pension models were thinking of. There was a little bit because the investments didn't do as well as people had hoped they would do. Um, benefit increases, I think there's a lot of news around how lavish the, the pension plans are. And in, in our analysis, we've seen that they really aren't uh, that lavish. Uh, and that only accounts for uh, five billion of this. Changes in assumptions, I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure it's just like moving things around. Well, overly optimistic investment. Oh, overly optimistic investment. People living longer. People living longer. Oh, people living longer. Yes, yes. that would be the other way we could, we could fix this problem. But the biggest problem is em employer com contributions. So there have been various points along the way where the actuaries say, in order to meet your obligations, the state has to match the contributions that the employees are making by a certain amount. And the state decided on several occasions that they could just skip those payments that year. And they make them up later. And the problem is compounding, that if you do that, uh, it makes it harder and harder to catch up. And if you if you fix it the next year, you have a chance, but the longer you wait, the higher up on that slope you wind up. So, oh yeah, so how we got here. Missing state payments. There are some structural issues. I believe it was back in the 80s or 90s, I don't remember when they, they made a change to the plan, the cost of living, the COLA. Oh, well, the original COLA was in the 70s. But then there was a change in the plan, so the COLA, Cost of living adjustment, excuse me, we're, you'll, they'll all get the lingo pretty soon. Cost of living adjustment had been fairly conservative and tracking with inflation, and so if inflation was low, then the, uh, the pensioners would get a small raise every year. If inflation's high, they'd get a bigger raise. Somebody at some point decided it would be very popular to make the cost of living adjustment a fixed 3% compounded. And so there were some uh, actuaries who were in the, uh, the Rep House of Representatives and they were saying, I sure hope somebody's setting aside the billions of dollars it's going to cost to pay for this, what we're just about to do. Uh, but they went ahead and voted for it, approved it, and it became the law. So we've been in a state, an area now, a period now of low inflation. And so the system is giving out raises to people above the rate of inflation. And because of compounding, it's actually going up quite quickly. That's a question, because I, I heard this, this claim. And I'm not an expert on it, but a little bit of research I've done. Well, it is true over the past 
relatively short period of time, sure, inflation has been low. But over the long term, 3% actually understates inflation, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. So, well, uh, this was a good deal for the state. When it was an Yeah. And it may have been part of the deal. Why now, we thought now that it's become a good deal for pensioners, uh, the state, uh, everybody's taking a back. Let's take it back. So, um, yeah, so in terms and yeah, in terms of, of recent performance, this is causing quite a bit of look at increase. Um, the other thing that's interesting in all of this is that there were some people, uh, I don't, when was the Constitution? When was the Constitution? 1970. 1970. There were some union people, I believe, who seemed to have a very good grasp of Illinois politics. <laughs> and they enacted a constitutional amendment that said that the state is forbidden to withdraw benefits that they've already have extended to employees. And they knew that what was going to happen is the state was going to screw it up. They're going to say, oh, we're insolvent. We can't do this. And then take, the, take back these benefits. So this constitutional amendment says, that's your problem. That's not the employee's problem. You've got to sort it, sort it out. Um, it's created some difficulty, but I think it's created some, some useful difficulty. Um, there's some funny things that happen, like in the, uh, the school system, where a lot of times the payroll is paid by the local authorities. They boost teacher salaries at the very end and then hand them off to the state retirement system, which uh, causes some, some gaps between the, what is paid in and the, and the benefits. So a lot of different problems, but I think one of the biggest problems is uh, everyone here is still awake, which is good, but mostly taxpayers fall asleep when you talk about retirement systems. And one of the times while they were napping, they did things like skipping payments in the retirement system and things like that. So the most important thing is for people to be engaged in this problem. Um, so we're working on trying to make it more understandable because it does seem very complicated and hard to, to grasp. And so we've been working on uh, two different tools to try to explain it. And we talk, demonstrating one of them and talking about the other. Uh, one is this pension calculator, which we'll show you in a bit, uh, where you can look at um, various scenarios and see how much the state has kicked into uh, your individual retirement and how much your, uh, you contributed to it. And we'll show you that more. And then a bigger liability calculator to look at statewide the problem. Um, so, but our, our intention then is to take these complicated problems and expose them in a way that we can show you what's going on in the math and people can make their own decisions. <laughs> This is an important slide. We often talk about um, the taxpayers versus the employees, that that's what this problem is. But that's only part of the dimension. When you're talking about investments, time is always a, uh, uh, um, a factor in all of this. So really, you need to look at both current taxpayers and future taxpayers, current employees, future employees. And democracies love screwing future tax players because uh, <laughs> they're not voting right now. Uh, so what we're uh, encouraging is that in this discussion that we look at how everyone can contribute to trying to, to solve this problem. Um, yeah, so we're trying to come up with these tools and trying to come up with a way that you can play around with different factors and see how you can come up with your own solution. Uh, and perhaps even go to extremes and see what, what that does to, to shock the system. So right now there are several, a uh, couple of reform plans that are out there. Uh, Speaker Madigan has one. Cullerton, which I think is from the Senate, which is a slightly different plan, and Rauner just proposed a, uh, his own plan, which is currently in the Supreme Court to see exactly no, what... No, the Madigan plan. The Madigan plan is in the Supreme Court. I guess Rauner is going to wait to see what comes out, to see what exactly is allowable under interpretations of the, uh, the Constitution. Uh, and so we are hoping to start looking at some other models of looking at you know, what happens if you do the most extreme immediate pain, uh, you know, how much do taxes have to go up, uh, how would I defer the pain as much as possible? So I'm going to hand it over to Dennis, who's going to demonstrate our application. Actually, I'm curious, uh, from that last slide, how many of you have been following the news on the pension reform? You feel like you know something about it? How many of you are like... Don't want to know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you think uh, you, you ought to know something about it? So, uh, so the big news this week was the 49%. <laughs> yes. The property tax. Right. The city of Chicago solved it. 
But and that's, for the, that's for the city plans, because the city has a $600 million balloon payment due to this year. Uh -huh. that, was city, that was city, I didn't follow. That was just a city of Chicago plan. <laughs> <laughs> Separate from these plans. Glad I don't own any property. <laughs> Is this online yet? No. So I'm sorry I did not get this online yet, but um, it's close. And Real soon. Yeah. What happened is I got a job, and all of a sudden I couldn't work on this. <laughs> the worst thing that happened to this project. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, we started off with this notion that this mic, this we call this the micro calculator because this is just taking. Um, data from one individual and kind of seeing, kind of assessing the fairness uh, or unfairness of uh, their pension plan. And uh, we wanted to allow you to tinker, you the users and pensioners and whoever, to tinker with it so that you could compare, you know, if I'm a pensioner, I want to know what am I <coughs> going to get today versus what, what would I get uh, if there's a reform, reform plan A, reform plan B, etc. So that's what this model is for. And um, right, so it basically takes information like uh, your gender, which anybody know why gender is important in a pension model? Longevity. Like, you know, huh? Longevity. Mort mortality, right? So women, uh, in, in, this is the other kind of interesting thing we found out about the uh, mortality tables is uh, who, uh, statistically speaking, who would live longer, myself or my 20 year old daughter? Actually, uh, I because I've already made it this far, I've got a leg up on my dog. And that could change because of you know mortality rates and so forth. So uh, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. So uh, you put in your gender, uh, what year you were born, uh, your anticipated year of death. Uh, you can play with that. <laughs> Okay, if I crank it up too high, we get a, we put a little note here saying you only have a 15% chance. <laughs> <laughs> and likewise, uh, you know, we do want you to be able to play with this stuff, but we want you to also be aware of uh, you know what are the, the chances of that happening. So that's too low. All right. So the goal to get uh, kind of an average fair reading on this is to go to about 50%. And it tells you right here. I'm sorry. Anything else? How about if I just look at the screen? Most of them. Uh, so there's, I'm going to switch this, sorry, to male. Um, so notice I already switched it to male and didn't decrease the age. So there we go. 83 year old male. Um, then this block here is to put in your, what, what year did you start working? Uh, till what age do you expect to work for the state? Uh, entity, uh, which was up here, we choose that up there. Um, how many years of service will you have had? What is your current salary? And then we just use some estimates to predict what is your final salary before you retire. And uh, if you don't want to, uh, if you have a more complex situation than this, uh, this is 2000 to 2035 when you're going to retire. Uh, you can go in and tinker with this and remove years and uh, set the salary to whatever you want. So that's all built into it. Or you can just accept, uh, way over here, you can just accept the default. Okay. Um, and after you've got all this information entered, basically you just click the calculate button down here. And Okay, you ready? So on the right hand side. It generates a couple graphs, but let me zoom in here first, and let's look at the, um, the table on top. So on the top, it will calculate what is the value of your contributions. So here's my salary going up every year, and uh, most plans have about an 8% uh, contribution rate. So I work for UIC, so I was kicking in 8% of my salary every year, and uh, that money is being held by the state. So what we what we did is we estimated what would that, all those contributions across all those years be worth at retirement, okay? And do, we just use, we use certain assumptions, and again, these will be assumptions that aren't here yet, but there'll be things that we can tinker with, 
Uh, if you want to see what happens, you know, during uh, if inflation goes up or if rates of return goes down or whatever, you can throw all that in there. But we use, a, I think, a 7% uh, combination of rate of return and, and inflation. Okay? Um, then we also looked at uh, when you retire, you get benefits till you, your assumed death, and uh, that's what that's worth. And I thought one of the simplest ways to look at, because um, uh, one concern I have is I occasionally hear somebody say, well, you know, two things. One is, uh, why do we pay people for sitting around doing nothing? And then the other thing you hear is, it's a Ponzi scheme, you know, that uh, there's you know, all these people paying in for future, uh, you, you, today's people are paying for, uh, today, today's workers are paying for t today's uh, retirees, and there's, it's kind of a Ponzi scheme that's gonna catch up to us one day, and it kind of has. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You know, if, if you look at this in terms of, um, this pensioner kicked in $600,000 and got $1,300,000, sorry, $1,300,000 back, you know, that's like a 45, they're paying for 45% of their own retirement with what they've contributed. And that is a little more generous than a matching 401k, but it doesn't, to me, strike, it does strike me as a Ponzi scheme or something that's outrageous, right? Um, so that's something I wanted to point out. We, we wanted to look at percent uh, self-funded as kind of our benchmark for, is this an extreme um, uh, benefit for employees or not? Um, and then we can also convert that into today's dollars. Okay, so let me scroll up and uh, so you figured this graph out. So this is my salary and those are my benefits. Here's my contributions in the dark green. If we took, um, if we look at this bottom graph, the red line is the, uh, the growing uh, value of my contributions. So the red, this, this red line to this point at retirement is how much uh, my, all my contributions, these green ones, are rolled up, uh, how much they're worth at that point. Uh, the other red line is if uh, we did the same thing, how much, we said how much do you, how much, what kind of a fund would you need uh, at retirement to pay out all these benefits, okay? And we applied the same, you know, that this fund will, will grow until you keep diminishing them. It, 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 the fund grows when you keep taking money out every year, so that's why it slows down. Okay, so uh, pretty simple. <clears throat> yeah. Um, our next step with this then is to allow you to um, do this not just for your current plan, but we also want to put right next to it the proposed Madigan plan, the proposed Rounder plan, the proposed Cullerton plan, and so in that way. Uh, pensioners and taxpayers, anybody who's interested in this, can take a look at and see how much of a haircut our uh, pensioner is going to take under Plan A or Plan B or Plan C. And uh, that, that's kind of why I jumped in this in the first place. Um, this is back in August, and I pitched it to the group, and Ben was there, and I think Dave was there the next week. And uh, I was interested in... Um, because I've got colleagues at UIC when I worked there who would say, you know, there's no way in hell we're going to give up anything. You know, the state owes us this money. It's a contract. And I agree in a lot of ways. And I wanted to know, um, but I wanted to know, is this a, uh, is, the, is the benefit uh, far exceeding, you know, what they, what any other organization would give people? And as it turns out, if you play with the numbers, it depends, right? So that's kind of where the next, of slides is going. Okay, if you are someone who has worked 35 years, okay, well actually I'll start with this one, sorry. Uh, if you are, one of the uh, features of a pension plan is it's, it's also a bit of an insurance plan. It's like the uh, 401k, when you die, your family gets all that money. If you die early, your family gets it. If you die late, you run out of money, right? So. It's kind of uh, the state and the organization has, the government has nothing to do with it, uh, with the 401k. With the pension, uh, if you, uh, this is, the, if you live a long, long life, uh, remember the, this is the slope of, uh, this is what my contributions are worth. Notice that the benefits are, are quite a bit higher. It's well over, uh, 
it's well over the, sorry, the, the, these dotted lines, if anyone, was anybody wondering what the dotted lines were? Those are just multiples of my contributions. So if the state had matched my contributions, it would be this first dotted line. If the, if the state had to uh, contribute twice what I contribute, it would be the second uh, line up there. You can see that uh, if I live a long life, obviously the state's gonna pay more than double, uh, well, match, do more than just a match. If I live uh, kind of an average lifespan, uh, the state will basically match, and if I die early, the state will benefit. You know, the state will get that extra little bit. They won't have to contribute as much, which makes sense. So it's part of the insurance nature of uh, pension plans. Okay, but there is another thing that I uh, went too far. Okay, um, if I am a 35 year retiree, here's where I get my, basically the state is matching my contribution. If I am somebody who works for 22 years, actually this is me, 22 years and still has another uh, you know, 10 plus years to go, I'm actually pretty close to funding my own retirement. Okay, it's just the nature of pensions. It's, it's, it was designed originally to incentivize people to stick around when they wanted to keep, you know, good employees, uh, uh, you know, valued employees or experienced employees. Can I just highlight yeah. that one? So the important part of that slide is this is to prove that Dennis is getting screwed by the system. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I came here tonight was to show you all that. But it, I, I just also want people to understand that, you know, it, 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 this whole topic is simplified in the newspapers and it's actually a pretty complicated topic. And, our goal is kind of to, um, to simplify it in a productive way. Okay? Um, and then here's the person who only works 22 years but works it right up to retirement and actually benefits the most. So uh, we had our meeting with uh, Don Harmon, the uh, senator, he's like the second guy under Cullerton. Uh, I pointed this out to him. I suggested, well, maybe the state shouldn't hire any 30 year olds. You know, they should only hire, you know, either young or fire all the people before they get to retirement. So, but it, it, it is, I think, a problem that this, the current way the rules are written uh, uh, definitely incentivizes people to stick around right up to retirement. Okay? And that can be good or bad, depends on whether you think, um, so, I don't know. It's a changing work environment, so, okay. okay. So that's all I had to show you, but the model is intended to help anybody uh, tinker around with the stuff and come to an understanding. We're also going to create infographics that will kind of can this whole spiel that I just gave. Uh, and and uh, we'll do some more research. One of the big things we want to do is figure out what percentage of uh, retirees are in each of those categories. You know, uh, retiring way before, I'm sorry, if, do they, how many work right up to retirement? How many? Uh, quit working for the state well before retirement, how many work 20 years, how many work 30 years, so we can get those demographics down and kind of make uh, a bunch of infographic graphics that will represent a, a better, uh, basically that, we could, that percent funded ratio, I think will be our key value that we can show for each of these people. And we further, can, we can- we get that from government data? It, yeah, we, we hope to get that from, we should be able to get all this. Uh, we've got a couple FOIA requests in for, that'll be talked about in a minute. But anyway. Tim? Thank you. Um, as Ben and Dennis have mentioned, there's uh, the microcalculator that they've gone through. But what we need to do is to take those same assumptions at the individual level and now apply those assumptions across five different pension plans within the state for the General <laughs> Assembly, for judges, for state employees for the university system and for teacher system, aggregate those together, recognizing that we have different types of tiers within each plan. We have some people who are on social security, others who are not. If you're a protective services employee under an alternative formula, you have the opportunity to retire early. So uh, what we're looking to do is to provide a transparent, no-spin tool that will allow stakeholders in the conversation to do the types of what-if analysis that Dennis demonstrated here. Uh, 
In the case of the macro model, and has uh, been talked about with compounding, rates of inflation, rates of salary growth, and um, rates of return on investment are some of the parameters. I'd like to demonstrate the open source package as well as the current system that's being used today. Uh, this is the current system. <laughs> this is the black box known as the published plan actuarial report. So for each particular pension plan, every year uh, an actuary is retained. The actuaries make a set of set assumptions, 3% salary increase, 7% rate of inflation. There are supplementary tables, some legislative language, and some projections outward. So this is the current system that is available for the public today. And now let me show you the open source system. <laughs> it's uh, Howard Winklevoss's Pension Mathematics with Numerical Illustrations, published in 1993. <laughs> uh, and that, that may seem humorous, but this is somewhat the state that we're in as stakeholders in public policy. There really isn't an open source calculator available. So a bit like the crew of the enterprise, we're kind of going where no one has gone before. <laughs> in conversations that we have had with various principals, there, there, there's a lot of numbers being bantied about, but to the best of our knowledge and belief, we have not come across or been made aware of an open source model to do the actuarial analysis at the multiple plan level uh, by state. If you are aware of such a facility, please let us know. So what are we doing? We're starting here with the published plan actuarial reports, and it's not a straight line process, but iteratively we are doing research and development to really understand the required data that is necessary, as well as building somewhat, frankly, by trial and error, the actuarial and the financial models that are necessary. What we have done is at the state pension plans data, uh, some of this is a classic people science problem. Um, if you do people science, you need the individual level detail. That is not published readily. What the reports do provide are summary information, so through uh, a series of techniques, usually with weighted averages, what we have done is using the General Assembly plan as our target, because that has about 158 active participants, under 1,000 in total. Uh, we've had to go out to construct detail level data that somewhat emulates as best as we can the members on that plan and then begin to use that to aggregate out. So what we are looking to do is that we're really in this phase right here of taking the, the published actuarial reports, uh, beginning to develop a common data model so that we can take the various combinations and permutations of the plan and use those in a common data structure. And then to start to develop the actuarial and financial rules that's primarily the development of how a population ages. So we're looking at if we have a starting number of employees, how many new hires will we have, how many individuals will retire from the system, who will terminate from the system or withdraw before retirement, and will there be any mortality or disability? Yes. Uh, I was mentioned earlier that uh, the required return on the, on the assets of the pension, pension plans would have to be 7%. Um, what was the expectation that that was, how was that 7% uh, going to be achieved? Well, through what, through what, uh, through what the, uh, combination of, of assets or bonds or stocks or what kind of, what kind, of, what kind of investments would have returned that amount? That's an excellent question. The plans last year returned 17% overall. So, and, but recognize that if you look at the asset allocation of plans, they tend to skew towards um, 
you know, it's, it's back to the search for yield. So you are seeing more investments in real estate, private equity, and hedge fund. But the question assumes that it's approached in a rational way like that, and in fact, it's the reverse of that. What really goes on is the actuaries come up with some numbers that they think are reasonably defensible, and the legislators and others that they're dealing with, the principles of the plan, want them to basically make that number as high as possible to, to keep the unfunded liability down as low as possible. So that's really a negotiation that goes on between the actuaries and the people they're reporting to at the plan about what number is acceptable. Uh, they do it in light of the data, but, uh, but they don't do it by saying, here's our assets, we project that we're going to get this rate of return. That's, they back into that. The comparative analysis that is generally done is to compare your state's estimated rate of return with the rates of returns from other states. And I leave it to you to kind of assess if you believe that's a valid benchmark or not. Okay. So what, what we're doing at this point is we're building out uh, pension plan data, and we're building out the actuarial and financial models. What we look to do is to develop a calculation engine the calculation engine will provide the capability to do stakeholder what-if analysis. So just as you said, well, let's say I don't believe it's going to be 7%. I think it's really going to be 3%. You'd have the capability to enter a 3% number, and then based upon the number of employees, their life expectancy, their time in service, at the end comes out really a series of numbers with here is the accrued liability for all for everyone in the state. This is what we believe the position, based on the rate of return, of the, uh, uh, the portfolio will result in. And then after that, we have a series of uh, cost related to what is known as normal cost, what it takes to fund a year in the pension system as well as the overall cost or accrued liability to pay off to reach 100% or representing, uh, shall we say, a, uh, uh, a surplus. And at the end of the day, the, the, the last number, which um, Ben had talked about, is that we're presented with an unfunded or funded amount as a uh, percentage of the plan. What we look to draw into the calculation engine are not just the pension plan data, but we've talked about composite survival models. So we look to bring in demographic data uh, from the capital market side. Uh, we look to bring in different uh, assumptions with respect to asset uh, return on investments. From a policy perspective, uh, what we look to bring in is uh, going back to the slide on the various alternatives, well, what if we want to kick this, change the amortization from ending in 2045 to 2095? Or what if we wanted to take the amortization from ending in 2045 to 2025? Uh, this really here is where we take the legislative language or anticipated le legislative language and convert that to data. What we're looking to present uh, out of the calculation engine uh, at a uh, top line level is to really look at in aggregate across five plans, the liabilities, the assets, the cost and contributions, and then impact analysis. Uh, in the first slide when we talked about magnitude of the problem, what we'll want to look at is the impact of the household and the pension level. So what we're in the process of doing right now is really replicating, reverse engineering the uh, projection of cost and liabilities that you see here, which is out of the, uh, the GRS uh, actual report. So um, uh, this is what we're looking to, uh, to produce. Uh, you can see here where we have the actuary liability, the assets, the unfunded liability and the funded ratios. And you hear us joking about the matrix mathematics, and that's just this ability to roll these numbers forward. From a visualization perspective, 
uh, or trying to think that less is more. We have two visualizations here. I think this is the one that's very interesting because it shows the unfunded liability and the state contribution. And I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on that. Uh, here on the actuarial report in the comparison of cash flows, what we see is the, the state contribution, the employee contribution. And in this case, you know, assuming investment income at 7.25%, uh, uh, that is what we would expect to see. And what we have here are some references to some of the reports that we've presented in um, this presentation. And this presentation is linked in the agenda doc for tonight. So if you go to the Open Gov Act website, you'll see. And the graph came out of a uh, report, uh, a, a blog entry by the uh, Civic Federation. Uh, we have data from the General Assembly Retirement System, as well as uh, a very interesting historical piece, uh, Illinois Pension Plans, what's passed is prologue. And Tim has about uh, 200 other links that we can provide you if you're interested. Seriously, if someone is interested, we've really made it a point in our Google Drive to provide a very comprehensive list of reports, not just for Illinois, there's a lot of conversation about what has gone in Rhode Island, and there's a lot of conversation in Wisconsin as a model of best practice. We've also tried to cover a range of public policy groups, really taking a, a broad spectrum of opinion, and we have that out there. And if you're interested, stop by. We can uh, sign you up under our uh, Google group for that. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted to add a couple things. Um, these guys are doing a great job along with the other people who are working on this. I wanted to explain my role since I'm up here. My role, my primary role is to act as a village idiot so that if I can understand something because my most recent technical experience is with Fortran, then we figure anybody can understand it. Um, beyond that though, we are also trying to simplify these two processes. <coughs> trying to reverse engineer the individual data and the model from the reports that do exist, as Tim described, is extremely difficult. So we are going to try and short circuit that, and I'm helping with Freedom of Information Act requests to the pension plans, asking them for the database, basically, of all the pensioners' statistics. Um, and secondly, we're going to ask them as well for the actuarial models that they're using. We'll probably end up in a fight with them when we're getting those but we're hopeful that we'll at least get some of the basic data so we don't have to reverse engineer all of that and so that the accuracy of our model will be much greater as a result. Um, so we're also doing that in parallel with this and hopefully that will greatly simplify the process of actually coming up with these models with more accurate data. And I think the data that we're getting out of this will probably be of interest to somebody out here because we're actually asking for every state employee uh, salary history for the last 10 years, hopefully birth yeah. year, if not birth date, a lot of information. So we'll be getting, hopefully, we right. soon reach that and we reject that request. Right. So it should be a nice data set. All the basic information necessary to essentially calculate from, the, from the, the basic data of the actual point liabilities. I'll add too that David's been great in helping us understand the political landscape because that's, we haven't even talked about that. Like, what's likely to happen? Is, uh, is a big political question. Yeah. Questions. yeah. So we can yeah. wrap up. We'll take questions after this. Okay. We just have a specific ask if there's some skills we can use some help on, certainly. Right. So, volunteer so, freely. Yeah. Questions? Actually, this is my, uh, uh, where is it? <laughs>